Good evening. Welcome to worship here at Augustana this night. Uh, we're glad that you are here in our final service for our Lenten services, uh, midweek services here uh, in the city. Uh, it has been good to be together these last um, number of weeks. Um, thank you to um, all of you who have made the journey a around town as really it is a Lenten pilgrimage, right? Uh, all around the town and... Uh, and you're here tonight, and we're glad that you are. Um, tonight we have uh, we are uh, assisted in our worship by Deacon Alexa, who is our our deacon here at Augustana, and Pastor Ron from Zion will be preaching for us today. I'm Pastor Kirk. For those of you who uh, don't know who I am, and I'm the pastor here. Um, Thanks to Sherry and the choir who's going to sing a little bit later, to our ushers and, and to all those who uh, helped prepare and set up for uh, some refreshments after the service, which we would uh, invite you to stay for um, afterwards um, as we gather around the tables and just to continue to share, not only in this time of worship, but in each other's lives as well. We gather this night beneath the tree of life, the cross of Christ, a sign of God's unfailing love for us and for all of creation. We come to hear God's promise to pardon and to strengthen and to heal us. And we come to collectively lament, as has been our theme throughout this journey, and to pray for the healing of the nations, to pray for the healing in our own lives, to pray for healing in our communities. And we come at Christ's invitation. Many of the songs that we're going to sing tonight, uh, if you follow along in your bulletin, they are short and repetitive ones that it draw us into a deeper meditation and reflection that help us to center us in our prayers this evening. And so you're invited to sing as we lift up our voices together in unity uh, to the one who is the source of our hope and our song. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, in times of distress, turn our hearts and our minds towards you. Let our communal laments be signs to those around us that we worship you, a God who hears and holds our cries. As we lament together in community, may we provide space to all searching for ways to voice their own pain and grief. Hold us together in your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our first song is from our purple books in the back of your pews called Beautiful Things 925. It might be new to some of you, and so I will help to lead the verses, hoping that you're going to follow along with us. Let's stand as we sing. Things you make. 
is springing up from this old ground. Out of chaos, life is being found in you. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. I invite you to turn in your bulletin to our confession and forgiveness. If you would respond in the bold print. Gracious God, we thank you for making one human family of all the peoples of the earth and for creating all the wonderful diversity of cultures. Enrich our lives by ever widening circles of fellowship and show us your presence in those who differ most Give us when we unknowingly or unknowingly participate in the inherent systems of oppression that exist in our world. Teach us to be bold and forge a new path in the way of peace and love for all. Break down the walls that separate us and help us find that unity of the fruit of righteousness and will enable us to become your beloved people. Empower us to speak boldly for justice and for truth. And help us to deal with one another without hatred or bitterness, working together for the mutual forbearance and respect. Friends, we have a God who is rich in mercy and who loves us even when we were dead in sin and made us to alive together with Christ. And so we know that by grace we have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Our Kyrie is hymn number 151. We'll sing it through two times. Kyrie, Christe, and then Lord have mercy. you to be seated as we hear from our scriptures today. Uh, since we do not have this printed in the bulletin, if you go to page 338 at the beginning, add about 14 pages, you'll come to Psalm 44 in the red book because it's really nice to have you respond to what I'm reading. <laughs> it is supposed to be a responsorial psalm. So Psalm 44, in the first section of the book, you go up to the Psalms, which ends around 338 here, and then you go about 14 pages beyond. I'll wait. <laughs> it's before the hymns, and it's after the service order. It's kind of confusing, I know. It's a hidden gem in our books. I bet you didn't know it was there, eh? <laughs> Thank you. 
two past here in the group. Good, I'll come and read you. I will give you some guidance. When I go like this, please respond. So it's every other verse until a certain point, and then I will direct you to the verse that we will be responding to then. Thank you. Psalm 44, which in this case is verses 1 to 10, verse 13, and then 17 to 26. We have heard with our ears, O God, our forebears have told us what you did in their days, in the days of old. With your hand, you brought the nations out and planted your people, your afflicted peoples, and dispersed them. For they did not take the land by their sword, nor did their arm win the victory for them. But your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, because you favored them. You are my king. Through you, we pushed back our adversaries. Through your name, we trampled on those who rose up against us. For I did not rely on my bow, and my sword does not give you victory. Surely, you gave us victory over our adversaries and put those who hate us to shame. Every day we glory in God, and we will praise your name forever. Nevertheless, you have rejected and humbled us and do not go forth with our armies. You have made us fall back before our adversary and our enemies have plundered us. You, this is verse 13, you have made us the scorn of our neighbors, a mockery and derision to those around us. Now verse 17, all this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you nor have we betrayed your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps strayed from your path, though you thrust us down into a place of misery and covered us over with deep darkness. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to some strange God, will not God find it out? For God knows the secrets of the heart. Indeed, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, Awake O Lord, why are you sleeping? Arise, do not reject us forever. Why have you hidden your face and forgotten our affliction and oppression? You sink down into the dust, our body cleaves to the ground. Rise up and help us and save us for the sake of your steadfast love. All this has come upon us Yet we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen. The great deeds of God on behalf of Israel shape this anguished lamentation that we've just read together. The great days of conquest made the tears of defeat more bitter. God's intervention through greats like Gideon and Deborah and King David made Israeli humiliation more insufferable. The esteem that David and Solomon enjoyed make the present taunts of neighboring kingdoms more vicious. All this has come upon us but we have not forgotten you. We have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back. Our steps have not departed from your way. It is not apostasy. 
but some mystery of redemptive sacrifice that must lie behind God's inaction. It is God's preoccupation, not Israel's sin. Neither revelation of God's character nor pedagogy of suffering focus here, only God hidden under the cross. Why do you sleep, O Lord? Awake! Do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? We sink into the dust. Rise! Help us! Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. As God suffers, so do God's people. When we suffer, we cry out to God. To whom does God cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All day long, I held out my hands to a rebellious people. When God suffers, God cries out to us. How are we to appropriate this bitter communal lament in our world today? Some would map the biblical Israel onto today's Israel. This is theologically fraught. Israel can and does rightly praise God's help in her battles. But what to do with the lament after the pause in verse 8, the great Selah that we never read and isn't printed in our books? Is this part of the psalm also a rehearsal of God's hiddenness in Israel's history, the exile, the diaspora, the Holocaust? Does that make it a lament upon a lament? How do we appropriate this psalm of lament today as a people of God. Even though the Christian church is a wild branch grafted into an olive tree, ancient, even though God manifest in victory and God hidden in defeat marked the history of the church, even though the church has voiced her communal lament with this very psalm, can we assembled here appropriate this psalm to lament our own community of faith? Can this psalm help us together voice our lament for the church in Canada? Every Reformation Sunday, we hear what deeds God performed for our ancestors in the faith. We know that nations were moved aside and settlers planted and not by the force of their own weapons, we proudly add, but by treaties and promises and no small measure of confusion. There was uprooting and replanting. There was afflicting and freeing, saving and confusing. So across 200 years, this church spread almost from sea to sea to sea, from the first services on the ice of Hudson's Bay to the little brown chapel on Signal Hill in Halifax, to the stone and brick bell towers of central Canada, to the whitewashed landmarks on prairie hills, and the little boxes in the growing suburbs, and the chapels and healthcare institutions and schools and universities. God prospered, God protected, God proliferated the church in this nation. Like the psalm writer and the psalmists and the hymn writers, the church poets in Canada have said, God, you saved us from our foes. We will give thanks to your name forever. But it's been a long time since the church in Canada has celebrated any victories. The great hopes of church growth in step with population growth died at least four decades ago. The church has been ashamed by social criticism. Her universities have been sold for a pittance to cover debts. Her health care institutions have been absorbed into a secular care system. Her housing developments have become mired in suits and countersuits. Her social justice agenda almost irrelevant. And even her ecumenical concerns have been thwarted as established churches ignored or absorbed their lesser neighbors, treating them like sheep scattered and ready for slaughter. Is it paranoia 
to imagine the big churches laughing at us these days? Yes, we can appropriate this communal lament as we cry to God, you have rejected us. You have abased us. You have made us a byword among the nations. But the ancient psalm could not stop there, nor can we. Faith does not end in lament. Communal lament leads to a communal declaration of faith. All this has come upon us, yet we have not forgotten you. We have not been false to your covenant of justification by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone. For as surely as the psalmist understood the deep darkness and brokenness of the cross pre-incarnation, so surely does the church in Canada today declare that our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from the way of the cross post-incarnation. Has the church in Canada forgotten the name of God? Has the church in Canada begun to worship a strange God? If so, then along with the lamentation, let us repent. But there is a deeper reality here. The reality St. Paul proclaims in Romans 8. A reality transcending the church struggle. He writes, God, who did not spare the only son, but gave him up for us all, will God not also with him give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As the incarnate Son of God raised his voice in lament for himself and for the community, so the church, as the body of Christ in Canada, laments with him for herself and her country. In his earthly ministry, Jesus literally embodied this psalm. Far out on a storm-tossed sea of Galilee, while the disciples lamented their sodden fate, the Lord Jesus slept on a cushion, unaware, unconcerned, uninvolved, his divinity hidden, under wet hair. At last, in desperation, they brought their lament to the Lord Jesus. Lord, save us. Redeem us for your own sake, according to your steadfast love. We have no guarantee except the Holy Spirit crying in our hearts, Abba, Father God. We have no guarantee that the Holy Spirit will rouse our Lord Jesus and calm the storms of our times to keep our little church afloat in this country. But at the very least, let us faithfully raise a communal lament. At the very least, let us rise up and remind God of our affliction and our oppression. At the very least, let us lament Oh God, why do you hide your face? Let us pray. Oh Lord, have you turned your face away from the church in Canada? Why do you let this church suffer disgraceful losses? Have we forgotten you? If we had, wouldn't you have known? Help us accept the suffering of the cross as the way of Christ in this country. 
and trust that your redeeming and steadfast love is working through us to save not only your church, but your Canada too. For even though all this has come upon us, we have not forgotten you, nor been false to your covenant. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The choir comes and gathers to sing. I invite you to turn to uh, hymn number 1020 in your purple books. Uh, we will lead the first two uh, verses and then invite you to sing along with us in verses 3 and 4. You can remain seated. Our prayers today begin with the litany for the nations. Let us hold before our God the nations of the world, asking for mercy and healing for those places and people torn by ancient animosities or terrorized by new fears, those devastated by drought, disaster, or disease, those crushed by poverty, oppression, or war, and those consumed and abused by power, wealth, or greed. May this act of solidarity bind us together and make us one in grace. 
As we sing the following hymns, you are invited to come as you are drawn, to light a candle from those already up here, placing your candle around the cross as a way to actively give our cares and concerns for our communities and our world up to God. You're welcome to stay up here and pray as long as you'd like, and those who wish to remain seated can participate by tracing the picture of the cross that you have in your bulletin as you offer your prayers to God. As we do this, we will lift our prayers in silence and in song. Just one hymn change. We will not be singing for the healing of creation, or healing of the nations, rather, but instead we'll begin this time of, of reflective song and prayer uh, with, with hymn number uh, 1041 in our purple books, God is Love, 1041.
gathering our many prayers into one, let us pray using the words of the closing prayer found in the bulletin. You are gracious and merciful, O God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You draw near to those who call upon you, crying out from their hearts. Hear our cries, receive our prayers, and fill the whole world with your blessing until we no longer with all creations into your grace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. My friends and siblings, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with the community however you find yourself comfortable. As we leave this place tonight with God's peace in our hearts and on our lips. Amen. 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 Let us be so. Please join us as we uh, move our way downstairs uh, for refreshments. There is an elevator just located out to your right as you walk uh, into the corner if you need assistance getting downstairs. <laughs>